Death can't keep its sting. It can't keep its prey. We just uh, sang. And we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. That on a day we can come and celebrate the Lord. I look out and see uh, new faces here and visitors. I want to welcome you here today. We're glad to have you. And I just thank you that we thank the Lord that we can come and worship the Lord together. I see my friend Jason out here, my old stomping ground buddy. It's good to see you, brother. But today we come to celebrate Christ. You know, there was a little boy named Philip, true story. He was born with Down syndrome. He attended a third grade Sunday school class with several eight-year-old boys, and he was made fun of and teased quite a bit. But because of the creative teacher, they began to care about Philip and accept him as part of the group, though they never really fully accepted him. Well, the Sunday after Easter, the teacher brought legs pantyhose containers to Sunday school. How many of y'all know what those are? I do. My mom used to wear those all the time. (laughs) The kind that looked like real large eggs. And each child received one, and the teacher told him to go outside on that lovely spring day and find some symbol of life and put it in the egg and bring it back into the class. And after running around the church grounds with confusion and excitement, the students returned to the classroom, and they placed the containers on the table. And surrounded by the children, the teacher began to open them one by one. And there was one with a flower, one found a butterfly, a leaf, and the fast food and awe of these little kids. But then the one was opened, and it revealed nothing inside. And the children set out, that's not fair, that's not right. Somebody didn't do their assignment. Well, Philip, he spoke up, he said, that's mine. Philip, they said, you don't ever do anything right. And the students uh, said to him, and he said, there's nothing there. I did do it right, Philip said. I did do it. It's empty. The tomb was empty. Well, silence followed. From then on, Philip became a full member of the class. He died not many months later, actually, after an affection uh, came into his body. But at the funeral, all the class came up. And they put a pantyhose egg on his casket to remind themselves that he's with Jesus in heaven because the tomb is empty, right? And today we celebrate what is truly the greatest celebration holiday of all of Christianity. Jesus could have been born the Son of God, but if he had never raised from the dead, there would be no Christianity of salvation by grace alone. And thank God for that empty tomb, right? Just two days ago, at communion, we celebrated and we remembered the ministry of Jesus Christ in each of our lives. His past ministry, his present, and his future ministry. But that ministry wouldn't be possible with a dead Savior. But today, we celebrate the resurrected King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He conquered the grave, and he is alive today, and he is risen and alive. But, yeah, we have to ask ourselves, wait a minute, though. Is our happiness just the fact that Jesus conquered the grave? We celebrate this because we know his victory over death means something for us also. It really does. If it didn't, it would just be an act for us to say, Yeah, he's God. He can do that. Wish I could do that. But for us today, in many ways, we also share in the victory over death and we share in the victory over the grave because of our Lord and Savior. And as Philip said to the class, the tomb was empty. And we know that means a life-altering event for all who believe in Jesus Christ. Well, last week... If you remember, we had a glimpse from the cross and what Christ suffered there. This week, we're going to drop in on a graveside scene and listen to Jesus as he speaks of life, death, and the resurrection. In fact, how to not die again, even when you die. I would say that this is worth listening to, to all the world. With all the self-help, anti-aging fads, and how people want to live today, what if you could tell somebody 
they actually could never die. Wouldn't that be amazing? Dear Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you that we are here celebrating your life, that you rose from the grave and you accomplished what you came to do for us. We thank you for this. Lord, I ask that we give you all the glory and worship you so rightfully deserve. We thank you for our great salvation, so rich and free. In your name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please turn to uh, John chapter 11, where we're going to discover that Lazarus, a friend of Jesus and a brother to Martha and Mary, he has died. He has, in fact, been buried, do you remember, for four days. When Jesus arrives onto the scene, he's been there four days. Let's pick it up from there. Please turn to verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had Lazarus already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Note that seeming paradox in verse 25 and 26, that believers shall live even if they die. We're this morning going to look at four integral parts to understanding and believing how to not die even if you do die. How to not die twice. Here in John 11, we are at the scene of life's greatest enemy, which is death. Weeping and sorrow permeate the scene. This is not an unusual scene with death. It's actually rather commonplace. You know, death is such a terrible and unrelenting foe. People without success have been trying to cheat death since death came into the world. Only Enoch and Elijah never experienced death. So you might as well say there's about a 100% failure rate on cheating death, right? From birth through middle age, you rarely talk about death. Because the more youthful you are, the more you celebrate life. But we all know down deep that death is coming. We're all going to die. Sooner or later, we'll take that last breath. We'll have that last heartbeat. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15.42, it tells us that these bodies of ours are perishable. That's an awful nasty word, isn't it? It's perishable. It ought to be labeled a swear word. It really should. Isn't that the word they write on vegetables and fruit being sent to the market? Perishable. Eat it within the next five days. Webster says it means liable to spoil or decay. And this word perishable in 1 Corinthians 15.42 is translated to spoil or to bring to a worse state. And sad to say it, but from the very first day we were born, we began to spoil. Every day we move to a worse state until we reach that last state, which is death. Somebody dis, uh, described this spo spoiling process as a war. They said it's a war to keep your mind together, your body working, your teeth in, your hair on, and your weight off. I'm like, well, that's definitely, I'm losing that war. You know, there's an old guy who was a golfer. He loved golfing. And he could drive a golf ball. But his eyesight was failing him. But he'd drive that ball. So he talked to his doctor about that. And the doctor said, well, hey, I know another guy. He's 90 years old. And he has awesome eyesight. 
perfect eyesight still. I'm going to hook him up with you to go golfing with you. So the man goes, <laughs> he goes, hey, did you see that? And the other guy said, I sure did. He said, well, where is it at? I can't remember. <laughs> man, getting older. The bumper sticker that says, eat right, stay fit, and die anyways. Those statements seem very defeating, very fatalistic. Way back in Genesis 3.19, God said to Adam as a consequence of sin that he would die. He said this, by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. And some have said, big deal, I'm used to dust. But down deep, that's just bravado. That's just false bravado. The fact is that jokes may hide the fear. And just like nice clothing camouflages a spoiling body, so does bravado when it comes to death. The grim reality to all mankind is death is a guarantee. And that death and what happens after death is a very big deal to humanity. So this morning we're going to look at this. And looking at John 11, 17 through 26, let's look at the first part to understanding how not to die, even if you die. Let's look at the first point, the majestic declaration in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Amen? Verse 21 Look at that. Martha, upon hearing of the Lord's arrival to the scene, she runs out to meet him, expressing one thought, that had he only arrived earlier, he could have prevented the death of Lazarus. If he'd only been here, Lord, he could have healed him, as he had done for so many others. But now that Lazarus is dead, oh my. Verse 32, Mary she says the same thing, indicating that he probably had spoken of this prior to Lazarus dying. But look back at verse 22. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Even now I know. I know you could have healed him when he was sick. But even now I know you can still do something about it. God will give you, Jesus, whatever you ask. What do you think she wanted Jesus to ask? Do you think she was asking for her pain and sorrow to go away? No, she wasn't. She wanted him to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. You know, that's, that's amazing to ask him that. That's better than when Joshua asked God to make the sun stand still, you know? Even now, Lord, raise Lazarus from the dead. What a stupendous request that is. No one had ever asked the Lord such a thing. They've asked him for healing, but resurrection? No. This was a big thing. But look how Jesus responds in verse 23. He simply responds this. Your brother will rise again. I don't think that's the response she was looking for, you know? The Jews, however, believed in a general resurrection on the last day. And Martha took... Uh, took the Lord's words to refer to that. Martha's like, no, Lord, that's not what I mean. I know someday he will be resurrected. And it is right there that Jesus Christ makes one of the most astonishing, majestic declarations and claims in all of the Word of God. He says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, Martha, she had faith, but it was not perfect. She really didn't fully know who Jesus was and all that implied in her statement in verse 27. She did not need, Jesus did not need to be there to heal Lazarus, did he? He could have done that from a distance. Jesus did not need to ask. The word there is beg, by the way. The Father for power or permission to raise Lazarus from the dead. Did he? Jesus, before proceeding, he wanted Martha and all of us to be sure that her faith and ours really understood who he was and who he is. 
whether this particular miracle was performed or not. He wanted us and them to know something. And Jesus makes this remarkable and true statement that resurrection power and life itself, whether at the last day or at the present moment, resided in Jesus Christ. It resided in him. That resurrection and life were embodied in Jesus Christ himself. Look at John 5, 21 and 26. 21, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so, the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Verse 26, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. What Jesus stated in John 11:25 and here in John 5, 21 and verse 26 is that he is not just a prophet announcing God's intention, but he is the divine Son of God, God the Son. Do you believe that? For God the Son who has eternal life inherent in himself just as God the Father does. And Aaron, it's the constitution of or a central character of something belonging by nature to. But we, we though we do not have inherent life in ourselves, our life is derived from others. Thanks, Dad. Right? But Jesus, here, his claim is to deity. For just as the Father derived his life from no one, so also the Son, for he is the eternal I am. He derived his life from no one. He has always been, right? So here we see this great, remarkable, majestic declaration from Jesus. Let's look at the essential condition. Verse 25. Condition. It's a clause as described in a legal document which stipulates or requires some specific thing. A condition. So Jesus makes the claim, but he attaches a condition to it. What is it? What could the condition be? Look at verse 25, the end of it. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. He who believes in me and everyone who lives and believes in me, verse 26. The promise of life, the promise of overcoming death, that we'll look at in a moment, is not for everyone. This promise does not go to everyone. It's only for those who believe in Jesus. When Jesus himself came into the world, many had the same problem that the multitudes have today. Namely, they didn't believe who Jesus claimed to be. They refused to believe in what Jesus said concerning himself and what he said concerning themselves. They wouldn't believe what he came to do for them. They wouldn't believe that they were sinners who were going to perish for their sins because they didn't believe that he was and is God incarnate. And they put him on the cross for that. This is the same problem with the lost and perishing world of today. Nothing has changed. This is your co-worker. This is your neighbor. This is your bank teller, your friend. It's your family member. These aren't just numbers on a spreadsheet. They're real people. They're real souls. But praise God, the believer in Jesus believes all these things. The real believer doesn't just believe them intellectually with his head, but they believe them where? In their what? Heart. You see all the church construction going on. Praise God for that. Those of you who are visiting, uh, Uh, please understand we're doing some remodeling. And there's a man here who does the remodeling name Armando. And the reason I remember that name so well, because my buddy Armand, I just don't have another one. He's the foreman for Trinity Construction. And he's leading the renovation here, the renovations. And he comes to my office every morning and will take up 30 to 40 minutes of time. And I'm glad for it. We have good Bible discussion. Though we probably don't agree on everything, we do agree this, that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and we are both brothers in Christ. He told me one morning, though, what he loved so much 
that God defies gravity. Rather than belief going down with God, it goes up defying gravity. It starts in the heart, and then it moves to the brain, he said. You know, that's right. I've said for a long time that the saddest condition to be in is not being full-blown lost, but being somebody full of head knowledge and no heart knowledge, thinking they are saved all the while they are lost. Armando said he has a term for that. That's called the brain saved. That's not salvation. But as already stated for us, the believer in Jesus Christ, We believe all these things. The real believer doesn't just believe them intellectually with their head. They believe them in their heart where it transforms our life through the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he is deity, that he is God the Son that that had come down to earth. We believe what Jesus says about the Bible. His word says of our condition that I'm a lost sinner, that you're a lost sinner who's going to die physically someday and spiritually apart from Jesus Christ. I believe. The believer believes that Jesus came to die for their sins, pay for all their sins on Calvary, past, present, and future. And we believe that our only hope of escaping the deserved judgment and the deserved punishment of the wages of sin, the, the eternal damnation, the separation from God, The eternal life without him is through Jesus Christ, the Son, the Savior, the died and risen King of Kings. And we believe that. It's to believe by trusting in Jesus, clinging to him, relying solely upon the person and the work of Jesus as the one and only hope of heaven. Listen to these verses. The believer... That can end the condemned. These verses only represent a few of the vast uh, verses that speak on this topic. You can just turn back to John 8, 23 and 24. But he continued, You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you, that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am He. You will indeed die in your sins. This is the opposite to the believer in John 11. Back even further in John 5, 24, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word word, and believes Him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Praise God for that. And you can go back even further, John 3, 14 through 18. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so to the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And here's the verse that we all know, but praise God, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And he goes on. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. The condition is belief in Jesus Christ. So we have seen the majestic declaration, I am the resurrection and the life. We just saw the essential condition that you must believe in Jesus Christ. Now let's look at another aspect, the absolute guarantee. By now this paradoxical promise is clear, isn't it? Jesus is speaking about something far more important than resurrection, isn't he? Yes, he is the resurrection and the life. The resurrection is an incidental thing apart from the life. What do you mean? If you're resurrected, aren't you alive? Ha ha ha. I'll check it out. Resurrection in the Bible is a term that only refers to the body. The more important part is your soul. Our spirits, and whether we are spiritually alive or spiritually dead. 
So Jesus goes on to speak of the most important part, which is the life. Verse 25, he who believes in me will live. I.e., that person that he goes right on living spiritually, even if he dies physically. And everyone, without exception, who lives and believes in me shall never die. No, never die spiritually. If you know Jesus, you're not going to die. Jesus is not saying here, though, that every believer, every true Christian will never physically die. We all know that isn't the case. Apart from Jesus Christ sounding the trumpet in the next few seconds or whatever before you die, apart from that, he doesn't promise we'll never physically see death. But I'm here to tell you, more important than me, Jesus is telling you, they aren't dead. They are alive and well. They are with Jesus, the author and giver of life himself, all those who have gone before us. The last few years, we have all experienced believers we know who have gone on to be with the Lord. And praise God for Jesus Christ and what he did, right? What is Jesus concerned with here? Why did he suffer the cross we spoke of last week? Jesus is concerned with spiritual life, and he's concerned with spiritual death. You see, the resurrection of the body is the least important thing. You see, everyone one day, believers and unbelievers alike, will have their bodies resurrected one day. The question is, but to which resurrection will you be resurrected to? Jesus spoke of that in John 5, 28 and 29. Listen to the words of the Lord. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. The one rises to life, the other for judgment, which Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15, calls it the second death into the lake of fire. But here we go. The promised guarantee for those who believe is life, never to experience that. Spiritual life is truly the sharing of God's life based on our belief and our trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior because of the work he did on our behalf. Spiritual death is to remain separated from God. What separates us are sins, and that separation is permanent. Listen to me. If you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior today, or if you think you do and you're not sure, Make right that decision today. Because once you die, it's permanent. Once you physically die apart from Christ, you remain spiritually dead for all eternity. And that is the saddest thing of all time. It's unnecessary. But here's the great news for us to the believer. Here's the great promise and here's the great guarantee. which should bring all comfort. It should bring all joy inexpressible. And to you, the And to to you, the unbeliever, here's the promise if you would only believe also. Jesus said, and he continues, said, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in me and the one who sent me has eternal life. If you know Jesus is your Savior, what do you have? Eternal life. And because Jesus raised himself from the dead, Paul said the same truth and guarantee as Jesus. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. We're going to be there in a month. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms 
in Christ Jesus. Amen for that. You can take this to the bank. Better yet, you can take it to your grave. Amen? Amen. Physical death can never and will never alter. It will never change. It will never touch your eternal soul. It will never affect you eternally. And that is a blessing from the Lord due to what He did for us. So the question is, how do you not die if you die? You have to believe in the Lord as your Savior. The one who died for our sins and rose again. Paying the price for our sins and conquering the grave. This is not small stuff. And it's stuff that we can oftentimes hear over and over. But it is so massive. It is so amazing. We should be praising the Lord every day, every moment. So we've seen the majestic declaration. We've seen the essential condition. The absolute guarantee. And let's close with the final aspect of understanding how to not die, even if you die. The indisputable evidence. The declaration, I am. The condition, believe. The guarantee is life, but now the evidence. And we see that this evidence is that Jesus can do what he claimed to do as he raised Lazarus from the dead. After all, anyone can claim great things and make great promises, but can they back them up? That's the key. Can they back up what they say? Skipping all the preliminaries and opening arguments, let's go straight to the closing argument. Let's go to the tomb. Look at John eleven thirty seven. But some said of them, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept the man from dying? The people here are still lamenting the fact that Jesus arrived too late. While Lazarus was still alive, while there was life, there was still hope. Jesus could have done something to prevent death. But now, can anyone conquer death? Can anyone conquer death? We know, what, what do we know? We know that Jesus could have easily prevented Lazarus' death. But verse 6 and verse 14 and 15 clearly tell us that he purposely did not come to the rescue to raise Lazarus from the dead. He did not do it because he wanted to teach them a bigger lesson that he himself is the resurrection and the life. Look at verse 39. He said, take away the stone, he said. you got to love this. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. You can see Martha's protest. I mean, she isn't understanding what Jesus is about to do, and she doesn't want him, bless her heart, to smell this terrible odor. She doesn't want him to go in there and see that. This is a four-dayer, right? And it's probably smelling pretty nasty by now. You know, they didn't have the modern technology we have today, obviously. But now the spoiling is at full force here. But Lord, she says, in all seriousness, when you think about it, death is a treacherous, terrible, ugly thing. It is no wonder Jesus grieved and wept in verse 35 about it. He was full of sorrow for their grief and sorrow that death brings what death brings in its wake. If you've experienced this, and I I think almost all of you have, a loss of a loved one. Wave after wave of sorrow beating down on the shores of your heart. Some days they are small waves, but often they are massive breakers that seem not to vanish as fast as those waves appeared. And Jesus grieved for their sorrow, but most of all for the high, high price of sin and the high, terrible consequence of it. At that gravesite scene, even Martha's previous faith is now shaken when she comes to the tomb door of death. But Jesus prays to the Father here so that all can hear, so that all could believe that the Father himself sent him and God the Son Spoke. And this is what Jesus spoke with all the authority. He said in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Can you see it? Can you feel it? Can you picture it? Notice something here. 
Jesus didn't say, oh, oh, grave, open your doors and give me back Lazarus, did he? He didn't say like witchcraft or the occult, spirits, please bring me Lazarus so I may speak to him. He didn't do any of that junk. He spoke with authority. He spoke with all the authority invested in him, for he's God the Son himself. And he spoke directly to Lazarus and commanded him to come out or to come forth. In fact, he spoke to Lazarus as if Lazarus could hear him. Right? Why? Because Lazarus could hear him because Lazarus was spiritually alive. He was a believer in Jesus. And notice Jesus referred to his physical state in verse 11 as only asleep. And he was going there to what? I'm going to wake him up. He went there to wake him up. He was definitely past stage four REM sleep, though. (laughs) When a believer dies physically, their souls go immediately to heaven, but their bodies remain in the grave. Yet the resurrection is so certain that even this in the scope of eternity is as a night's sleep. Over and over again throughout the word, physical death is referred to as sleep for the believer. Amen for that? Look at verse 44. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Amen. The dead man came out at the mere command of Jesus, who is himself the resurrection and the life. Is he the resurrection and the life? Do you believe it? Can Jesus deliver today what he delivered then? You bet he can. He can do it because he says he can, he has proved he can, and he is God, the Son himself. He can do it a thousand times, a million times, a billion times, a trillion times, and on past any number we can come up with. But you know, as great and marvelous as the resurrection of Lazarus was, it is not the resurrection I want. No thanks, I don't want that. Do you want that kind of resurrection? His living spirit was called back to a same old body, poor guy. A dying body that Lazarus had to die all over again. I know he died all over again because I haven't seen him walking around. Jesus did raise three people from the dead, and he seemed reticent to do that when you study it, as he knew he was bringing them back to more sorrow, more limitation, and death again. But he did it to teach us. Listen to this great truth. There has only been one resurrection that is into life, never again to experience death, and that is the the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son himself. He's the only one. And this is the grand proof and the great evidence that he is the one and the only resurrection and the life. Do you believe that? Yell amen. amen. Better yet, this. Just when you think what he did for Lazarus was miraculously amazing, going back to his majestic declaration in verse 25, he raised himself up out of the grave. Now, I call that bigger than that, what he did for Lazarus. He raised himself up out of the grave. Jesus said this of his own life in John 10, 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. No one takes my life. I lay it down by my own initiative, he says. And I take it up again by my own power from the Father. And he did this for his love for us. Over and over again, Jesus said he would rise on the third day. And right on schedule... He did just that. In Matthew 28, 16, the angel said to the woman, He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Can you imagine being the person who heard that from the angel? Therefore, Jesus goes and tells us in John 14, 19, Because I live, you will live also. Praise God. 
because he has risen just as he said. Only one day the sleeping bodies of all believers will be raised. But we won't be raised like Lazarus to limitation and death again, but to glorious bodies like the live risen Lord. Some of you look like you're half asleep, and I don't understand. Whew. Maybe it's because I'm hot to it. Because I study it. But this is powerful. If I could make it more powerful, I'd scream. I'm so excited about what Jesus has done for us. In 1 Corinthians 14, 42, it tells us this of our resurrected bodies one day because of what Jesus did for us. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. The body that is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. The body that is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. Then the body sown in its natural body, it is raised a spiritual glorious body. Can you imagine? And unlike any false religion in the world, there is no Easter celebration in the false religion of Islam. Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Judaism, Theism, Atheism, or any other ism, or any other ology. Only in Christianity do we have and believe in a resurrected Savior. That is the reason, and that is the full-blown truth, why we are alive in Jesus Christ today. Hmm. So today, we celebrate Easter as we all believe the good old hymn, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victory from a dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Come on. I don't even sing. I was thinking of all the singing this morning. I was like, wow, what a talent. Praise God for all the talent. I somehow sing awesome when I'm in the shower. But when I turn things down, I lose my voice. I never understood that. Actually, I do. We have a risen, conquered Savior over death. And death no longer has a sting over us. We have a triumphant Christ and we have a triumphant message to tell the lost. Let's not just celebrate today, but every day of our lives. Every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and every Monday through Saturday in between. Easter, it proclaims that on the third day after his death, he was resurrected and alive. But it affirms so much more than that. He was alive the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and he has been alive over the over 723,000 days since and forever. He will live on for eternity. He is alive. We serve a true risen Savior who is in our hearts, giving us His provision, giving us His power, giving us His promises on a daily basis, 24-7, 365, who wants to abide with us and fellowship with us and have a relationship with us. What an amazing privilege. What an amazing, oh, it's amazing grace, really. One great day when He, who is our life, our Savior, He will appear. And we shall also appear with him in glory. Colossians 3, 4 says, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. For we serve a risen Savior, and our lives should be like his. For Romans 6, 8 through 10 states this. Romans 6, 8 through 10. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And may we give our life to him fully and live to God every day. Though these physical bodies of ours may be spoiling, let's take comfort in the spoiler alert. Our souls are not spoiling. They live forever. Spoiler alert. Next time you look in the mirror, spoiling. I got a spoiler alert for you. Put a sticky note on there, remember? Peter, 
1, 3-4, gives this truthful, joyful proclamation. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance. Here's here's you and here's your inheritance. It's an inheritance that can never perish, it says, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven just for you. Praise God for that. Ours, people, is a living hope. It's never going to spoil. It's never going to fade or perish. All to the grace and all to the mercy and love of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we need to in our life, let it ring loud in your life. Let it ring strong. Let it ring true in your life. Let it be your anthem. And let it be your battle cry that I am alive and well. And I have a triumphant message to tell all people. Amen. John eleven twenty five. This is what is our cry. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live. Even though they never die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And Jesus said, do you believe this? I ask you, do you believe this? Amen. So let's celebrate, you believers, thanking God for our salvation. And let's proclaim fearlessly this majestic message to others. And let's go tell of our risen Savior. And let's live a life pleasing to him. To those of you who may not know, if you have not believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then not only will you physically die, but you are already Right now, spiritually dead. And you will remain so. But we have great news for you. That news is the gospel. That it doesn't need to remain that way. For Jesus Christ paid that price for you. Jesus paid and did what you could never do on your own. He paid your sin debt for you. And he has taken away the penalty of that sin. And he wants to bring you from spiritual death to life. Because he died for you. And he rose again as your risen Savior. He is the resurrection and the life. And he wants to give you that salvation right now. Freely by grace. Let today, if that's you. Decide today, I plead with you, to have this day be your resurrection day so you too can say that you will never truly die. Today you can immediately go from death to life by believing, immediately, by accepting and giving yourself to the true resurrection and the life, Jesus Christ. All of heaven will rejoice. And realize it or not, so will you, because Jesus will come rushing to you and boom, he will save you immediately. I beg you, I plead with you, don't let another day go by without knowing Jesus is your Savior. We have this great majestic declaration. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we have the essential condition. All you must do is believe in me as your Lord and Savior. And we have this absolute guarantee, which is life itself. And we have the indisputable evidence. He has risen from the dead. Jesus has risen from the dead. Right now, I'm going to play a song for you. And I'm going to crank it loud and crank it big. And we're going to celebrate in Jesus. And we're going to go out of here saying, "Woo!" and we're going to have our hearts flowing over, right? And when I'm done with that song, I'm going to say he is risen. And I want everyone to scream from the top of their lungs, he is risen indeed. Can we do it? Everyone please stand. Let's, let's do it. And if you want to know Jesus as your Savior, come down in this song and meet with me, please. He is risen! He is risen One more time. He is risen! He is risen Amen. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for rising from the dead and giving us eternal life. Lord, we thank you and praise you on this day. For you are the King of kings, the risen Lord. You are God the Son himself. And only through you can we have salvation. Let let us proclaim it, live it, and let it burn in our soul. Let us be so grateful and give you all the glory and praise you rightfully deserve. Jesus, thank you. In Jesus Christ, amen. amen.